I took my flying lessons at a little airport, airport called Montebello. Uh -huh. No longer an airport. Uh -huh. It's a big truck yard now, but uh -huh. so interesting. It was owned by Edgar Bergen. Yeah. And he kept his plane there, and a lot of the movie stars used to keep their planes. He did. He filled it up. It was a nice, very nice, uh -huh. modern airport with a restaurant, and he had a service uh, company there and hangers and. People like Wallace Berry and Jimmy Stewart came in and out from time to time. Mm -hmm. And so these guys all kept their planes there. And uh, so their, the quality of the instructors there was pretty good. Mm -hmm. And that was where I took my uh, initial flying lessons and got my so first solo in February 1941. And, and I got my private license. And then I learned that there was a... Uh, an opportunity, there was a committee that was working mostly around the Los Angeles area, although in, also in some other parts of the country, it was called the Clayton Knight Committee. Yes. You're familiar yes, with that? Yes, And one of the instigators of it was Frederick Lord, who was that American soldier of fortune who fought in the Spanish Civil War. Uh -huh. And the Clayton Knight Committee was actively recruiting pilots for the Royal Air Force. And the deal was, if you had a commercial license, which in those days took about uh, $200 uh, to pass the exam, if you had a commercial license, you could qualify as a ferry pilot and go to Canada and be commissioned with the RCAF. And uh, then your job was just solely to ferry aircraft across the Atlantic to Britain. Uh -huh. But the other offer was that if you had a minimum of 85 hours and you were willing to undergo a refresher course, uh, then you were committed to join the Royal Air Force, the R RAF, yeah. not the RCAF, but the Royal Air Force, and go into combat. Yeah. And so that was what I did. I applied to uh, the, they sent me to a doctor to pass the physical course. I passed it with flying colors. Uh, they gave me a flight check. Uh, my, the heaviest thing I'd flown was a Super Cub, uh, but they gave me a flight check in an AT-6, and I did very well in that. And the guy said I was a good pilot, so that's how I ended up going to Tulsa to take the refresher course. Uh -huh. uh, and I was just 20, or not quite 20, when I was accepted by the late night committee. My dad had to sign a waiver of some kind. Yeah. I, I remember getting the papers by mail and uh, uh, sending them to him, and, and he signed them and mailed them back to me, and I gave them to the British consulate. So he was a World War I veteran, and he was... Uh, he was very patriotic and very conscientious American, and uh, he went through, I know later, <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit more of a story there, I know later he went through a lot of agony when I ended up in active combat, but I know he was proud of me, and uh, he assented. My mom, of course, uh, was willing to do whatever I wanted to do. So, uh, in July 1941, I sent in my application, and they said, well, we think it's best if you quit your job and uh, disentangle yourself from any of your affairs in Los Angeles, uh, because we think you, you'll be approved soon. So I, I did that, and I went home to Denver and waited with my folks, and it was uh, very, right after the 4th of July, I got this letter approving me and designating me to go to the Spartan School of Aeronautics in Tulsa. And I had to go back to Los Angeles to report in for final uh, commitments with the British Embassy. And I did that. I went, uh, took the train back to Los Angeles and got everything cleared. <coughs> and then they left you as a civilian. There was no actual formal swearing in into the military. But what they did was just simply say, uh, are you agreeable to this? And I said, yes, I am. It was all verbal. There was no signing of anything. And so I said, yes, I'm agreeable, and I'm agreeable to, to joining the Royal Air Force as a combat pilot. So they gave me money and a plane ticket, and I traveled to Tulsa. 
and uh, there I entered the program, which was run parallel with the training that was going on with the RAF cadets. Uh, as I remember, there were, was about 60 of us that had been collected from all around the country. A guy, a guy named Maxwell Balfour was running Spartan in those days. He, he was uh, quite a an historic American pilot. He flyer. He knew a lot about it. And he's quite a figure in aviation. <coughs> Our instructors were excellent, I thought. And I, I remember when I first got to Tulsa and was lined up with the other Americans that were in this class I was in, that Max, Maxwell Balfour himself welcomed us to the school. Uh -huh. uh, and I remember him saying something about how he was pleased that Spartan could play a part in, uh, in this and uh, that he was uh, grateful for us, we Americans. Remember, this is before Pearl Harbor. That's right, yeah. And uh, he was grateful for us uh, Americans to uh, take on the defense of democracy. And uh, uh, in a broad sense, we were being uh, world patriots, is pretty much the way he put it. So he was quite a distinguished guy, I remember. And uh, I also remember very well my flying instructors. Um, I had one guy who went through with me almost all of the flying. I started out in uh, Fairchild PT-19 and uh, then went into AT-6s. But for navigation training, we used the Spartan Executive, which was a remarkable aircraft, way ahead of its time. Now, were these instructors, they were all civilian American civilian, instructors? Yes, all civilian. And, and what, were, what was their discussion, knowing you fellows were going to f uh, fight for well, the RAF? They wanted, uh, they wanted us to be just as good as they did, so they tried very hard to do a good job of instructing us, but they were, they were under, uh, under the gun to uh, qualify us. In, in other words, if we did not do well, if we did not qualify, they could wash us out, as, uh -huh. as, as, was the way they, as they should, uh -huh. just the way that Americans who went through the U.S. cadet schools, yes. some of whom did not make it because they just simply didn't qualify for whatever reason.